thank you so much. Um, thank you all for coming. So um, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, which basically is neuroscience and psychology mixed together. And I bring people into my lab, and I try to understand the brain mechanisms that give rise to how people make decisions, how they act, how they interact. In The Influential Mind, I share the science of how people form beliefs, why these beliefs can be quite stubborn, but how change is possible if we understand the human mind, if we understand thinking. So we're going to start by exploring thinking. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little experiment with everyone here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you three numbers, and I want you to figure out the rule that I use to generate those numbers. But just keep it in your mind for now, okay? Don't say anything. Okay, so my numbers are two, four, and six. So now I'm going to give you an opportunity to give me three numbers, and I will tell you if those numbers fit my rule or if they do not fit my rule, and then I will let you guess what the rule is. Okay? Okay. We'll start with you. Do you want to give me three numbers, and I'll tell you if it fits my rule or not? 8, 10, 12. 8, 10, 12. It fits my rule. Do you want to guess the rule? Yeah, no, that's not my rule. Okay, let's try another one. Um, do you want to, with a, with a, yeah, you? Um, oh. 20, 20, I can't see who's talking though. <laughs> oh, here you are. Uh, 20, 22, 24, it fits my rule. Do you want to guess the rule? No, and we're going to do one more. This time I'll let someone who wants to, because I probably know. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, it fits my rule. Do you want to guess my rule? Yeah, I No. But it was a good attempt. Okay, so my number is simply escalating numbers. Anything will do. So 5, 10, 100 would be a yes. 501 would be a no. What is the point of this experiment? So the point of this experiment is to show you that based on a very limited set of data, you form beliefs and hypotheses in your head, and then automatically the first thing you try to do is you try to confirm those beliefs, right? You try to find evidence that confirms what you already believe. And rarely do we try to challenge those beliefs. So for example, there's a few people here who thought my rule was even numbers, escalating even numbers, and so they went out and tried to confirm it by saying 8, 10, 12, right? And that's exactly what I did when I first learned of this experiment. But if you had a belief and then you tried to um, challenge it by saying, for example, you thought it was even numbers, but you'd say 1, 3, 5, and I would say, yes, it confirms my rule, then you'd know that your belief is wrong and you'd get to the truth quicker. So this is an example of what's called the confirmation bias. It was first uh, demonstrated by Peter Wason in 1960. So Peter was an academic in my own department at UCL. He passed away a few years before I joined the university. And the reason this experiment is so important is not about numbers. The reason it's important is because we all hold a range of beliefs in our heads. Right? We have beliefs about gender and scientific theories and beliefs about how things should um, work in our company, in our industry, in our family. We have beliefs about ourselves and our kids and our partner and our relationships. And without knowing it, we go about our day every single day trying to find evidence that can strengthen those beliefs. And rarely do we try to challenge them. And the question is, what happens when you do encounter a piece of evidence or an opinion that challenge what you believe? So we wanted to look at that question in the domain of climate change. So together with my colleagues, we wanted to give people information to see if we can change their beliefs about climate change. And I'm not only talking about people who are skeptics. I'm also talking about those who already believe. So what we did is, first of all, we asked everyone, um, do you believe in man-made climate change? Do you support the Paris Agreement? And based on their answers, we divided them into the strong believers and the weak believers. Then we asked them, by how much do you think temperature would rise in the next 100 years? So unsurprisingly, the weak believers gave us a number that was smaller than the strong believers. Then came the real test. 
We told half of all our participants that the scientists have reevaluated the data, and they now conclude that actually things are much, much better than they thought, and the temperature would rise by only a little amount. We told the other half of our participants that the scientists have reevaluated the data, and they now believe that things are much, much worse than they previously thought, and the temperature would rise by a very significant amount. Please give us your new estimate. The question was whether the information we gave them will change their beliefs. And the answer was yes. But mostly when the information we gave them already fit their worldview. So when the weak believers heard that the scientists now conclude that actually things are not that bad, they moved a lot in that direction. But when they heard that the scientists are saying things are much worse, they didn't budge at all. The strong believers showed the opposite. So when they learn that the scientists are saying things are much better than we thought, they're actually not that bad, they actually didn't move much. But when they heard that the scientists are saying the situation is much dire than we thought before, they moved a lot in that direction. So when you give people data or express an opinion that confirms to what they already believe, to their general worldview, they will take in that information with open arms. But when that data challenges what they believe, they will look at it with a critical eye. So this is another example of the confirmation bias. The confirmation bias is not new. But today, as information is so readily available, we can find evidence for whatever we want to believe, right? Information on the internet for whatever we want to believe. And that is actually causing people to go more to extremes, right? To go apart rather than come together. So we wondered what was going on inside the human brain when people are confronted with opinions that are different from theirs. We conducted a study in which we popped people into our lab and we asked them to make financial decisions together. Specifically, they had to assess real estate. And while they were doing that, we recorded their brain activity in two MRI scanners. But they could communicate over computers. So the way that it works is that each person lies like this there's a head coil on top and a little mirror. And on the mirror, we project a computer screen. So we can show whatever we want. Real estate, we can show the opinions of the other people, and they can respond using button boxes. So we recorded their brain activity, and what we found was when two people agreed, each person's brain showed precise encoding of the information coming from the agreeing partner. So what I'm showing you here is a slice of the brain, if I were to cut your brain like this and look inside, and what I'm highlighting are regions of the brain where we show activity is better encoding information coming from an agreeing partner. And so when two people agreed, their confidence in their own decision was enhanced. And that's not surprising, right? But when they disagreed, metaphorically speaking, it looked as if the brain was shutting down and it wasn't encoding coming, the information coming from the disagreeing partner. And what happened to people's confidence in their own decision? It didn't change much. So there was only a small, non-significant decrease. Interestingly, sometimes we blacked out the computer screen. So people could not see what the other person was thinking. In those situations, nonetheless, people also became more confident in their decisions. I can only assume that they were thinking that the other person is probably agreeing with them, and so they became more confident. So when people see this, they usually ask, well, is this true for everyone? What about individual differences? Well, if you see yourself as highly analytical, which I guess a lot of people here do, embrace yourself. A study conducted at Yale University by Don Kahan um, showed that people with better math and analytical skills are more likely to twist data at will. <laughs> they have the skills to do it, right? What they did was they tested 1,000 Americans, and the first thing that they did is they gave them math questions and logic questions. And based on that, they divided them into those with the uh, better skills and those with the worst skills. Then they did two things. The first thing they did is they gave them a set of data and they told them that this data was looking at whether skin treatment was helping rashes. Please look at the data, analyze the data, and tell us whether it's helping or not. Well, unsurprisingly, those with better math skills did better at this task. 
Then they gave them another set of data. And they said, this set of data is looking at whether gun control laws are reducing crime. Now, the difference here was that everyone had a very strong opinion about gun control. Some people were for, some people were against. And that strong opinion interfered with their ability to analyze the data. And in fact, those with better math skills did worse at this task. It seems that they were using their skills not to get to the most accurate conclusion, but rather to find fault with the data that they weren't happy with. So the question was, why has our brain evolved to take perfectly good information and discard it when it doesn't fit our views? Well, the brain assesses a new piece of evidence in light of the knowledge that it already stores, because on average, that is in fact the correct approach. So if I were to tell you that I saw a pink elephant flying in the sky, you would assume that I was lying or delusional, as you should. Because on average, when a piece of data doesn't fit a belief that you hold strongly, that piece of data is in fact wrong. There are four factors that determine whether a piece of evidence will change your belief. Your current belief, your confidence in that belief, the new piece of evidence, and your confidence in that evidence. And the further away the piece of evidence is from your current belief, the less likely it is to change it. There is one exception, though. When the new piece of evidence is not, doesn't confirm to what you believe, but it's exactly what you want to believe. Let me give you an example. So, um, in August 2016, a few months before the presidential election, a group of scientists asked 1,000 Americans to predict who was going to win the election. And they also asked them, who do you want to win the election? Well, back in August, about 50% wanted Trump to win, and about 50% wanted Clinton to win. But back then, both the Trump supporters and the Clinton supporters believed that Clinton was going to win. So then they gave them a new poll. And the poll predicted a Trump victory. And they said to them again, OK, so who do you think is going to win the election? And the question was whether this new piece of evidence will change the prediction. And it did. But mostly, it changed the prediction of the Trump supporters. They were elated by this new poll, and they said, well, maybe Trump is going to win. The Clinton supporters, on the other hand, they didn't change their prediction that much. They said, well, not sure. We still think that, that she's going to win. So when we um, are confronted with a piece of evidence that doesn't fit what we want to believe, our immediate reaction is this. Denial, <laughs> rationalization, and simply trying to distance ourselves from that piece of evidence. And perhaps the most efficient way to do that is not to expose ourselves to that data to begin with. So take the stock market, for example. Do you know when people look into their accounts to check on their stocks? Without any intention of making a transaction, just to have a little peek. So what I'm showing you here in black is the S&P 500 over two years. And in gray is a number of times that people logged into their account just to see their value without any intention of making a transaction. Now, these are not raw numbers. They've been corrected for all the obvious confounds like market volume and willingness to, to transact. So what do we see? When the market is high, people log in all the time. They think, well, if the market is high, my value has gone up, and they want to have a sniff of the good news. However, when the market is low, people are less likely to log in. They think, well, if the market is low, my value has gone down, and they don't want to know. And all of this is true as long as negative news can reasonably be avoided. So what you don't see here is what happened a few months later in the financial collapse of 2008, when the market went drastically down, and that's when people started logging on frantically, but it was a little bit too late. So in the words of Harper Lee, people generally see what they look for and hear what they listen for. Or to put it differently, we perceive what we want to perceive regardless of the evidence. <clears throat> now, our mistake is 
that we try to put a clear mirror in front of people. Right? We try to say, I'm right and you're wrong and here's all the evidence and the figures and the data and it doesn't usually work because the brain will frantically try to distort the information until it gets a picture that it's happy with. But what will happen if we went along with how our brain works, not against it? So that's the idea of the influential mind. We have biases that have evolved over a million of years of evolution. It's very difficult to change the biases themselves, if not impossible. But we can work with them to make a change. And so in the influential mind, what I do is I highlight the seven factors that science shows is most important in how people generate beliefs and make decisions. And then I say, well, can we work with those factors when trying to impact others? Um, and I will give you a few examples of, of what uh, those factors are. So the first one is a factor that I already told you about. So I already told you that people are more likely to take in information that comes from agreeing partner, right? Information that fits what they believe. And so our instinct of usually coming in with ammunition when we disagree and say, well, I'm right, you're wrong, and here's all the reasons that I'm wrong, usually doesn't work, right? However, if we start with common grounds, with a common belief or a common motive, we will be going along with how the brain works. So let me give you an example of how that can be done. So some parents um, decide not to vaccinate their kids because of the alleged link to autism. Now, the common um, approach of health professionals is to say, well, here's all the data and all the figures suggesting that there isn't any link. But studies have shown that there is only a limited impact, if at all. So then a group of scientists at UCLA said, well, can we use another route to get to the same outcome? The desired outcome is to have parents vaccinate their kids. But can we do that without even talking about what we disagree, which is the, uh, the link to autism? Can we talk about something that we do agree on? So what they did is they highlighted what these vaccines are actually doing, which is protecting kids from the mumps, measles, and rubella. So potentially deadly diseases. And this is not something that the parents disagreed on, but it seemed to have been forgotten in the heat of the debate. So by highlighting this common belief and also a common motive, because both the parents and the doctors wanted the kids to be healthy, they were able to create change. So parents' intentions of vaccinating the kids were enhanced three times as much than the common approach. And this approach worked for another reason. It worked because it conformed to the second principle, which is highlighting progress, not decline. What we find is that people tend to encode information suggesting that things can get better in a more efficient manner than information suggesting that things can get worse, such as a Trump and Clinton um, example that I showed you, right? When the information was desirable, people took it in. When it was undesirable, they resisted. This is called the desirability bias. And let me show you one example of this desirability bias that we've um, shown in our lab. So we brought people into our lab and we asked them to estimate the likelihood of 100 different negative events that can happen to them. For example, what is your likelihood of um, experiencing cancer? And then we gave them um, the average likelihood of someone like them experiencing the disease. So cancer can be about 30%. And we asked them again. What is the likelihood that you will suffer from cancer? So we did this for 100 different events, and what we wanted to know is whether the information that we gave people will change their beliefs. And again, it did, but mostly when the information we gave them was better than what they expected. So if someone said, my likelihood of suffering from cancer is about 50%, and then we said, you know, for you, the average likelihood is about 30%, so that's good news, they said, well, okay, maybe for me it's only 35%. So they learned quickly and efficiently from good news. But if someone started off saying, my average likelihood is probably about 10%, and we said, you know, for you, the average likelihood is about 30%, the next time around they said, yeah, for me I think it's still about 11%. <laughs> so it's not that they didn't learn at all, but they learned much less when the information was undesirable. 
And it's not that they didn't remember the information that we gave them. Everyone remembered the average likelihood of cancer, the average likelihood of being a victim of card fraud, but they were less likely to think it's related to them when it was a negative information. We also did this while recording people's brain activity. And what we found was that the brain was very good at encoding good news, at encoding all the negative, positive information in many regions in the brain, including this region here, which is called the left inferior frontal gyrus. However, the other side of the brain, the right inferior frontal gyrus, was coding negative information, and it wasn't doing such a good job. And so, as a consequence, people were more likely to be receptive to the positive news and less likely to the negative news. And so we wanted to know whether we can change that. Can we change how people encode information by directly changing the activity in the brain? And there is a way for us to do that. So this is my collaborator. And what he's doing is he's passing a small magnetic pulse through the scalp of this participant to the regions of the brain that I showed you. So he can um, target one region at a time. And by doing that, he is interfering with the brain activity of that region for about half an hour. And after that, everything goes back to normal, or so we hope. <laughs> but during that time, we can uh, do our little task. And so we did this for three groups. Uh, one group was a control group. So if I were to just test all of you here, this is the average amount that you would learn more from good news than bad news. So this will be your desirability bias. Then we interfered with a part of the brain that was coding for negative information. We interfered with it. And so our desirability bias was enhanced. And when we interfered with a part of the brain that was coding for positive information, again, we interfered with it, the bias went away. So we were quite surprised by this, because we were able to eliminate a deep-rooted bias in humans by changing brain activity. But of course, we're not going to go around zapping people's brains. And so what that means is that when people see um, negative information, things that they don't want to hear, like a smoker sees smoking kills, they say, yes, smoking kills, but mostly it kills the other guy. But when they hear that the housing market is going up, they say, oh, my house will definitely rise in price. So what does this mean? What this means is that if we can reframe the message to highlight the positive information, how things can get better, we might have people listen to us more than highlighting how things can get worse. For example, instead of telling a teenage kids, if you smoke, you gain cancer, you might say, if you don't smoke, you're more likely to get on the basketball team. Or instead of saying, if you take route A, you will lose time and money, you might say, if you take route B, you will gain time and money, right? Highlighting how we can get to our goals. But let me show you a more, a more empirical example. So this is a study that was conducted um, to see whether, they, whether we could get people to wash their hands more frequently. And specifically, we all know that sanitizing our hands is the best way to um, stop the spread of disease. And this is especially important in hospitals and in restaurants. So in a hospital on uh, the East Coast, a camera was installed to see how often medical staff wash their hands before and after entering a patient's room. Now, the medical staff knew that the camera was installed, right? It wasn't a nanny camera situation. Nevertheless, only one in 10 medical staff washed their hands before and after entering a patient's room. But then an intervention was introduced, an electronic board that told the medical staff in real time how well they were doing. So every time they washed their hands, immediately there was positive feedback on the board. It would say, good job. And the current shift rate and the weekly rate went up. So there were actually people in India watching them in real time and changing what's up on the electronic board. And what happened? The compliance rate rose to 90% almost immediately and stayed there. So this is such an amazing effect that the group of scientists wanted to make sure that it was real. So they replicated in another division in a hospital. Here, the medical staff started at 30%. 
So one in three medical staff wash their hands before and after entering the patient's room, which is actually closer to the national average, which is 38%, both in hospitals and restaurants. Um, and then the electronic board was introduced, and again, same effect. It went up to 90%. Okay, so why does this work so well? It's not about hand washing. It's a very general principle, which is instead of using the normal approach, what would be the normal approach in this case? The normal approach would be to warn the medical staff of negative, negative things that can happen in the future, right? Illness and disease. Instead of warning them of these negative events, they actually highlighted progress, highlighted how the medical staff was getting better all the time. And it actually did another thing. It gave the medical staff immediate rewards. So every time they sanitized their hands, immediately they saw positive feedback on the electronic board. And that positive feedback would generate a reward signal in people's brains which then reinforced the action that caused it, making that action, washing the hands, more likely to be repeated again and again in the future. And that's the third principle, immediate rewards. And here, both words matter, immediate and rewards. So first of all, we find that immediate rewards are more effective at changing behavior than rewards that you can get in the future. And there's at least two reasons for that. First of all, um, what is known as the attribution problem. So imagine your partner is washing the dishes and then you give them a kiss. Well, it's clear that the kiss is related to washing the dishes and that will reinforce the, the action and they're more likely to wash dishes again and again in the future. <laughs> Try it tonight. <laughs> now, Imagine that your partner is washing the dishes, but you give them a kiss the next day. Well, now it's not clear that the kiss is related to washing the dishes, and so it's less likely to reinforce it. So that the, that's the attribution problem. The second reason immediate rewards work better is because of what's known as temporal discounting. So temporal discounting is the idea that rewards that we get now are valued more than rewards that we get in the future. For example, if you give people a choice between $100 now and $110 next week, most people will actually take $100 now. One of the reasons for this is that $100 now are certain, right? Rewards that we can get now are certain. But rewards that we get in the future, they're uncertain. And people would rather have certain things now rather than uncertain things in the future. That's one reason. Now, if we turn to the second word, reward. So we find that rewards are more likely to induce action than punishment. And one reason for that is what we call the approach avoidance rule. So in life, to get the good stuff, whether it is um, chocolate cake or love or a promotion, we usually need to act. We need to move forward. So our brain has adapted to this environment where to get the good stuff, you need to act. And our reward system is very tightly connected to our motor system. I'm showing you um, one part of the reward system here. And so what I'm showing you here are um, neurons in the midbrain, duperinergic neurons, and they project to the middle of the brain, to the striatum, as well as the nucleus accumbens, which people call the reward center of the brain, as well as to the cortex and the motor cortex. When we anticipate something good, when we anticipate chocolate cake or a kiss or money, a go signal is generated in the midbrain and it makes action more likely. However, to avoid the bad stuff in life, whether it is poison or deep waters or untrustworthy people, we usually need simply not to act, not to do anything not to get close, right, to avoid. Not always, but often, the best approach is simply to do nothing and not to take a risk. And so our brain has adapted to that environment where to avoid the bad stuff, we need not to act. And so when we anticipate something bad, like a loss, a no-go signal is generated in our brain, and it actually inhibits action. 
And so you can see why to get the medical staff um, to wash their hands, warning them of bad stuff that can happen in the future of illness is not necessarily the best approach, while promising them a reward is more likely to elicit action. Now, these rewards can be money or they can be positive feedback. I mean, we know that people go out of their way just for those little likes on Facebook, right? Um, but in general, generally, what does that mean? It means that if we want people to do something, if we want our kids to uh, tidy up their room, um, if we want an employee to um, work hard on a project, promising a reward may be more effective than threatening with a punishment, right? So you can tell your kid, well, if you uh, tidy your room, you'll find your beloved toy under the pile. But if we want people not to do something, if you want the kids not to eat the cookie or an employee not to share privileged information, you may actually um, threaten with a punishment. And there's another reason that this strategy worked so well. And it's because it enhanced the sense of agency of the medical staff. So no one was telling them what they needed to do. No one was threatening them. No one saying employees must wash their hands, right? Like you see often in, in bathrooms. It was up to them to make the decision. So, and that's our next um, principle, which is expanding agency, expanding the sense of control. One of the major things that the brain is trying to do at all times is control its environment so we can get rewards and avoid harm. And so in the brain, control is actually represented similar to a reward, similar to food, similar to sex. And so people are motivated to get control. And one way to have a feeling of control and agency is to make a choice. And what we find, as well as other people before us and after us, is that making a choice changes the way that you value the options that you have. For example, imagine that you are, um, have to choose between two destinations for your vacation. One is London and one is New York. They're both really great and you don't know what to choose, but you have to choose something and you say, okay, I'm going to go to New York. What we find is that seconds after making that decision, people reevaluate the option and they devalue the option that they rejected and upvalue the option that they selected. So they would say, well, thank God I didn't chose London, it's rainy and gray there, and New York was such a good decision, I'm going to see lots of uh, theater and it's a great place. And when we look at the brain, we see that the reward center in the brain signals um, to the chosen option more after it was selected relative to before. So just making a choice enhances the value that is assigned to that option. So what does it mean? What this means is that giving people a choice will enhance their motivation and their commitment to the chosen option. Now, none of this works when you choose for someone else. They have to make the choice themselves. Now, you don't want to give people too many choices. We all know the famous jam study, where people were given a choice between 20 uh, different jams, and they just they were overwhelmed and didn't choose anything. Um, so too many choices are not good, but two or three choices can actually be a good way to get people to act, to get them to enhance their motivation. So um, if it's your kids, have them make their own salad, right? Choose what to put in. Um, in any, any case, in any person that you're talking to, if it's family or, or an employee, giving them some kind of choice or just a perception of choice is enough. <laughs> Let me give you an example where the perception of choice was enough to make a change. And this is a, an example relating to taxes. So um, this was a study conducted by a group at Harvard by Michael Norton, Jan Emanuel Deneuve, and others. And they were um, thinking, well, the thing with tax is that we don't like to pay our taxes, right? But one reason that we don't like to pay our taxes is that we have no control over it. No one asking you, do you want to pay? How much do you want to pay? Where do you want the money to go to? In contrast, giving to charity is something that mostly we like to do. We decide when, how, and to what, right? Now, often, your money that goes to charity will go to the same place as your taxes, let's say to a hospital. 
but people still prefer charity because it's their choice. So they said, well, can we give people a perception of choice? So they simply asked them, tell us, where do you want the money to go to, your taxes? How much do you want to go for education, for science, for uh, medicine, and so on? And simply giving people a voice increased their intention to pay their taxes in full by twofold. They also did another experiment where people actually had to pay taxes to their lab. So volunteers came in and they had to give part of the money to the lab as lab tax. And in one condition, they gave them an opportunity to suggest what they will do with the money. For example, take the money and buy food for the other participants. And when they did that, people were more likely to pay their lab taxes rather than when they had no choice. So enhancing a sense of control is um, a really um, powerful way to enhance motivation and change action. Okay, so these um, different principles that I talked to you about, um, they may work on, in most situations and um, in relation to most people, but it is important to consider the mental state of the person in front of us. Because under different mental states, the way that our brain functions really changes, and it can change the way that we process information. So for example, under stress, our brain really changes the way it functions, and it changes the way that we process information. Um, we did a study where we wanted to stress people out to see what happens. And how did we stress people out? We brought them in the lab, and we said, you're going to do a task, and when you're done, we're going to give you a surprise topic, and you're going to have to immediately give a speech about the surprise topic in front of everyone else, and we're going to judge you, and we're going to record you, and we're going to put it on YouTube. <laughs> And this is what they're doing to me now, but I, I had time to prepare. And we wanted to make sure that there was stress. So they we took their saliva and we measured cortisol in their saliva. We measured their skin conductance. So when you're stressed, you sweat and your skin conductance goes up. We also asked them, are you, sweat? Are you, are you stressed? And they said, yes, we're stressed. They were stressed. <laughs> And then we gave them the same experiment that I showed you before, where we gave them a lot of negative um, different events that can happen to them, and we asked them how likely is it to happen, and then we gave them information about it. And what we found was when people got stressed, immediately they started taking in all the negative information that we gave them. So at that point, they didn't have a desirability bias. They encoded both the negative and the positive the same. But when they were relaxed, Again, they show the desirability bias. And this change was within seconds. People get stressed and they change the way that they process information. And so you can see why after public stressful events, such as, for example, market collapse or a terrorist attack or a natural disaster like we had recently, people get stressed. And even if the event happens across the world, like a terrorist attack, even if it's across the world, people get stressed. And then they start being hypervigilant to all the negative information that they hear around them in the media and so on. And it changes their perception, making them more pessimistic. And that can lead to some suboptimal decisions. So for example, after market collapse, many times people will sell their stocks when in fact holding on is the best decision. Or after terrorist attacks, people will um, cancel holidays, they will cancel flights and then drive a car instead, which again is a suboptimal decision. And it, interestingly, it changes the amount, um, the stress level actually changes with age. So turns out that kids and teenagers, their stress level are relatively low and then it goes up, 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 hitting peak in your midlife and then starts going down again. So this is not surprising, right? Midlife is when we have, we have to take care of our kids and we have our careers and sometimes also taking care of elderly um, parents. And happiness, by the way, goes the other way. So happiness is quite high relatively and kids and teenagers go down, hits rock bottom in your midlife. But the good news is it goes up again. And it actually stays up. Um, until the last couple years of life. So perhaps you're dealing with someone like this. And then the question is, well, how do we reduce stress in others? And how do we enhance happiness? Well, interestingly, 
the thing that um, affects happiness the most is not what is happening to you at the moment, but what you think is going to happen to you in the future. Let me give you one example. So this, again, is a study that was conducted at Harvard, where they asked um, people who were about to go on vacation every day before vacation how happy they were, every day during vacation how happy they were, and then every day after vacation how happy they were. Do you know what was the happiest day? Right, the day before. So they were sitting in their office. They weren't on the plane yet. But that was the happiest day, because in their mind, they were already on vacation. And in their mind, it was perfect. Now, when they went on vacation, it was nice. But you know, flight delays and kids screaming, not as good as it is in your mind. So what does this mean? It means that an easy way to increase happiness and lower stress is creating anticipatory events, right? Have a vacation planned. Have the weekend um, events planned. Something to anticipate, both for ourselves and for our family and, you know, in the workplace as well. Something that employees can work, can look forward to. Um, right, so I'll just um, end with this, which is, most of us are not aware of how our brain works. We're not aware of all these biases that we have, that we go about our day trying to confirm our beliefs, or that simply making a choice, just buying something in the supermarket, makes it more likely that we would like that thing. But becoming aware of all of these um, biases and um, factors means two things. First of all, it means that we can be more conscious of our own decisions and our own beliefs. How do we get there? And is it what you know is it what we want and number two if we understand how brains around us work well that means that we'll be more effective at communicating information and advice to others so um that was kind of a little glimpse of uh some of the things that's in the influential mind and um i'll keep the rest in the book but we have time for questions now i think so How does all, all this work in our life today where we're, we have real facts, alternative facts, real news, fake news, and also the idea of gaslighting, the, what's happening with the government, and can the government use sophisticated information about how we react to things to control the way we see things? Yeah, so that's a really big question. Yeah, I think that all of these... Um, all of these things, especially the confirmation bias and the desirability bias, um, it has much more of an effect today for the reasons that I said, right? Because we have information everywhere. And we have less ability to know about how credible the information is. Because we're not quite sure where it's coming from, right? And so if we want to believe something and we see it without knowing if it's a credible source or not, we will be open to believing that. So all of these biases are having much more an effect today. And you know, as we see, it's a negative effect to some extent, um, which causing polarization, causing fake news, and, and so on. Um, so I, I absolutely agree with that. What can you do about it? I, I think, I think um, that websites such as Facebook and Twitter and all of that um, have some responsibility to take action, right? And they're starting to do that, right? It's, it's becoming clear that this is a real problem, it's changing reality. Um, and I think they're starting to do that. Like for example, it shouldn't, there's a lot, there should be much more um, rules and regulations, and there isn't. I mean, I was surprised at the things that you could do which, which are permittable. So for example, um, you are allowed to take someone's photo, create a Twitter account with that person's photo, and then put racist comments. So it looks like the, the person in the photo is making the racist comments. And, and that's allowed. So you go to Twitter and they say, no, legally that's allowed. And so these things should not be allowed. But I think the legal system is kind of like, is behind, is lagging behind um, with these regulations. And hopefully they will speed up. Because um, I, think, I think regulations will be important. And as I said before, punishments are actually good for deterring action. And so in this case, deterring all these things that we see online, I think the, the fear of a possible penalty, which there's just not enough fear of penalty online, will be helpful. Oh. Thank you.
thank you for the talk. I have a, a question. A lot of the examples around persuasion and your principles had to do with factual evidence around hand washing, vaccination, efficacy, et cetera. Have you done work or do you think the same, how do the same principles extend to a domain which might be a little more nebulous and ambiguous like ethics or aesthetic discussions between people? Do you think the principles are similar? Is it a different domain? I'm curious about your thought about the, the more ambiguous domains. Um, if anything, it will be stronger in those domains, right? Because when things, let me give you an example. Um, so the desirability bias, there's a study showing that, um, so what they did was they took people and said how attractive you are, okay? So you rate your own attractiveness. And then they asked everyone else to rate your attractiveness. And they told you what the result was. So when, and this is a very subjective thing, right? And so when people uh, learned that others see them as much more attractive than they are, they were quick to move to that direction. So they said, well, maybe I'm better looking than I thought, right? But when they heard that people are saying they're less attractive than what they thought they were, they didn't move much in that direction. They said, well, it's subjective, right? My mom thinks I'm attractive. <laughs> so certainly when things are clearly subjective, right, then you have much more wiggle room. And so all of these effects will be stronger. Hello. That was Hi. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned that confirmation bias is decreased under stressful situations. Or oh, desirability bias, not confirmation bias. Oh, the desirability. So desirability bias is a bias um, that we learn more from positive information than negative information. Unexpected, po unexpected positive, we learn more than negative. But under stress, you actually learn more from the negative. So if, but if you were trying yeah. to relay negative information, stressing the person out would be more effective? Yes. Well, it's true. Is, would, would that be useful like in a counseling situation then? I, I did consider that before, yes. Yeah, so, um, so it is, it seems to be true. Um, and the question is, what, what is your goal? Right. By doing that, yes, they're more likely, you stress them out, you give them negative information, yes, on average, they would learn more. Um, but then they will also be more stressed, you're reducing their mental um, well-being and so on. So that's something to consider. Interesting. Thank you. <laughs> so shout at your kids first and then tell them all the bad things that can happen. So, <laughs> so how do you change your own habits using these kind of techniques? Um, so as I said, some of the habits are biases. You can't change the way you perceive things, but you can change what happens by putting in policy. So if you know that you have a bias, you can put in a policy in place. Let me show you an example. So when I ride the bike, I usually don't put a helmet on, right? One of the reasons is I say, yeah, you know, I'll be fine, right? So then you put in a policy which says every time that you don't put a helmet on, you punish yourself. You'd have to give like a charity, you'd have to give money to a charity of the other, you know, group, um, something that you don't believe in. Or you can promise yourself your reward. Any time that I put on the helmet, when I get to the office, I get a little chocolate, right? Um, and that, that seems to work. So again, if you're like, you, you don't go to, um, to the gym because forever, even though you don't like it, whatever. Think about a reward that you can get at the gym, which is different from just this future reward. So for example, some people told me they go to the gym because they tell themselves, if I go to the gym, I get to read these like trashy magazines. And that's the only place I do it, right? So think whether there is a reward that will um, influence the likelihood that you will do that action that you need to be doing. That's unrelated to the action itself, yeah. Could you give us an example of how you might deal with a political issue? Say, say Brexit. Say that if you were a person that thought England should stay in the European Union um, and um, you're in the situation that England is, is now where they're committed to leaving it, but there's people that are fighting to change that. I mean, what would, using the information that you've developed, how would you advise Tony Blair or one of, one of those people uh, to approach the situation? Yeah, I think the problem uh, with both Brexit and um, Trump election was that in both cases, um, people had a vote that gave them a sense of control, right? There was a certain situation, and they, um, by voting Brexit, 
you vote for a change. So you're, you have a sense that you can control right, the future. You can control the future of your country by making a change. While voting stay doesn't really change anything and has less of, a, a, of this feeling of control. And I think, and now, those that did vote uh, Brexit definitely feel like they had control, because they did, right? So there has to be, um, they have to think of a way, how can we convince people that voting stay actually give them a sense of control? And maybe even a change for the better, right? Could we stay and still make things better? Because, you know, one of the problems both with, with the Brexit and in Trump, you know, people were unhappy with the situation, and that's a fair fair point of view. Um, the economic situation and, and the differences in, in um, groups, you know, is, is a problem. And so by voting those, those votes, they actually was ho were hoping to change for the better, right? They, it, it's an, actually an optimistic thing, right? A lot of people tell me, well, don't you think that was pessimistic by voting Trump or voting Brexit? Brexit? Um, but no, I think, you know, the message, you know, Trump's message was make America um, great again, right? It was like an optimistic thing. You are in a bad state, but you can make a change and make things better. And the same thing with Brexit. Um, so I think it, you always need to think, how can you give people a sense that they do have control and the option to change? Um, and it's not always easy, but. Uh, hi, um, thanks for the talk, it was very interesting. Um, I have a question about uh, so you gave an example with the uh, medical professionals and the hand washing saying that you know some sort of positive feedback was more effective at changing behavior than than something negative so has there been any research or do you have any ideas on like what sort of if you if you want to get people to change their behavior exactly the, the nature of the kind of feedback that's required so for example right like you, you say well if you don't wash your hands then you know disease will spread you can easily flip that and say, if you do wash your hands, then disease won't spread. And that's right. positive because you flip, you know, the yeah. first half of the sentence is negative and the second half of the sentence. So is that good enough to, you know, get the same jump to 90% compliance? Um, and if it's not, do you have any ideas, you know, why it might not be? Yeah. So maybe this is a good time to say that, you know, um, psychology, behavior, and all of that, it's not physics, so it's not like gravity, right? It's not that there's a rule, and it's definitely going to work in every situation, right? The, the brain is very complex, and our behavior is very complex, and it will be um, not right for me to say, oh, yes, this is going to happen. I don't know. Each situation is unique, and all I'm showing you is some concept that there's been a good literature that suggests that they work. Um, so that's one thing to say. And so... Um, yeah, you know, the idea was can you bring, can you reframe the message so, so to highlight the positive? Why do you want to highlight the positive and not the negative? Because people don't like the negative, right? They don't want to listen, they turn away. Let me give you two examples. Um, for example, on, on airplanes. So, um, um, at the beginning, you know, you're about to, you're about to take off and um, the, the stewardess would, would tell you about all the, um, Oh, how do they call it? The, the safety safety procedures, right? They, and people would not listen, right? And one of the reasons they don't want to listen is it kind of creates anxiety. You don't want to hear what happens if the brain is go if the brain, sorry, if the plane is going down. Um, and so they wouldn't listen, right? And this was a huge problem with with um, with this. And so um, some of the companies uh, thought, well, can we actually flip it? Can we highlight the positive? Highlight the positive destination, right? Put some music, put some humor. And so you've probably seen this um, going on flights like Virgin and so on, right? Now it's all about the wonderful place that you're going to get to and other techniques, but it's all enhancing positive feelings. And in one of these cases, with the first, one of these first attempts, um, this was Virgin, um, they actually found that they put it on YouTube and millions of people watched, watched it without actually being on the plane. <laughs> so that's like an, one example of highlighting kind of the positive instead of the negative message which causes people to turn away. Another good example is a study that was conducted at Stanford where they wanted to see what will get people to uh, donate to uh, charity. It was one of those kind of GoFundMe websites. 
And what they found was that when you put a picture with a positive image, like a smiling girl that needs money for, um, because she's ill, people are more likely to donate than if you put a picture of someone who looks like they're ill and suffering. Because the suffering person, you know, you feel bad for that person, but people don't want to look at it, so they turn away. They're more likely to look at the positive, right? And they're more likely to give charity if it's a positive. And this is quite interesting because a lot of um, these ads for, you know, for donation, they usually actually show the very sick and ill. Um, and their study suggests this is, is not the most effective way. Do you have any examples of, in your own work or your colleagues' work where you have caught yourself or really, like, said, oh, I had confirmation bias or desirability. I'm a scientist, of course. Yeah, yes. so, yeah. <laughs> so this is what we do every day. No, obviously, it's, uh, I mean, because this is what scientists do, right? We have, our, we have our hypothesis, and then we have data, and of course what we're trying to do is confirm our data. Um, and so we have to be super careful about this. But one way to be careful about this is that everything goes, I mean, this is not the solution, but you give it to other people, um, some people that are, don't necessarily have the same prediction as hypothesis in you, and they will critique it um, and review it. And so, yeah, of course, we have it, too. Yeah. Are there ways, or do you have any tips about how to tip people who may be in a high anxiety state who take the data and go towards paranoia a lot of time <laughs> to better weight the, the favorable possibilities? Yeah, you know, we, we, yeah, we have data that suggests that um, anxiety and depression is not quite the same in terms of how people seek information. So actually, we find that anxiety is related to wanting more information in general. So people would just seek for a lot of information in, if they're in an anxious state, both positive and negative. But it's true that they seek, for, they seek all this information and then they do learn more from the negative than healthy, non-anxious individual, rather than, than the positive. Um, how would you make them weight the positive more? I think maybe via deliberation. So, I mean, this is kind of a technique with cognitive behavioral therapy and others, where you have to find reasons for why the negative is not related to you and the positive is related to you. So go through all of the, the this is, how, how is this negative thing gonna happen? And then go through why it won't and the positive why it will. Um, best I can answer now. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.